The 2001 holiday movie Pearl Harbor is a sweeping uh, historical dro- uh, document based on uh, actual events. It's a story, it tells the story of boyhood friends Rafe McCauley, played by Ben Affleck, and Danny Walker, played by Josh Hartnett, as they enter World War II as pilots. Rafe, the Ben Affleck character, is so eager to take part in the war that he leaves and heads to Europe so he can fly, fight along England's uh, Royal Air Force. When he arrives in England at the English airfield, he walks by the British uh, Spitfire, uh, Spitfire fighters who were shot up in a battle the previous day. And while the commander is taking him on a tour and showing him the airplane that will be assigned to him, a messenger comes in with the news that two more British planes had just been shot down. The commander turns to Rafe and says, Are all Yanks as anxious as you to get themselves killed? And without hesitating, Rafe responds, I'm not anxious to die, sir. I'm anxious to matter. Anxious to matter. It's a common goal for us today, I think. Studies show that that's one of the number one questions that gets asked in the lives of people every day. It drives many of the decisions that we make. And it shows up in the form of other questions that we ask. Questions like, what will others think of me if I do that? Or, What will others think of me if I don't do that? Or am I making a noticeable difference in this world? Will people miss me when I'm gone? Is my salary at a level that communicates any kind of importance? Do I have the right job title? It's a problem or an issue that's been with us ever since Adam and Eve walked in the Garden of Eden. It was woven throughout all of the gospel lesson today. And you heard in it that Jesus contrasts the attitudes of those disciples with the attitude in the lives of the little children around him. Now Mark will expand on that theme more in chapter 10 than he does right here. It's in chapter 10 we we read where Peter and James came up to him and and said, "We we want the privilege of being able to sit on your right and left hand side when we get to heaven. Which of course infuriated the other ten disciples who were hoping to have the same privileges and, and, and they became indignant, the text says. James and John, and actually all 12 of the disciples, weren't thinking at this time in terms of the kingdom's value system. The world where their minds were values things like power and prestige and forces and might. The world's impressed if my dad can beat up your dad, for example. Jesus described the world of their day as like this. He said, you've observed how godless rulers throw their weight around, and when people get a little power, how quickly it goes through their heads. And then Jesus adds a sentence to his followers that says, I don't want it to be that way with you. Walking on in grace, our theme for this stewardship month here in 2024, means that we seek to find the meaning of life and, the, and how our lives can matter in a totally different way than what the world does. It's a way that gets modeled by Jesus. And Jesus says it like this in Mark 10. I didn't come to, serve, or to be served. I came to serve. And I came to give my life as a ransom for many. And throughout the Scriptures, and particularly in our text today, and in the in expanded text into Mark 10, Jesus shows us that a life that really genuinely matters is a life that serves. It's a life that, that seeks to put the needs of other people first. It's one of the things that we as a congregation ask all of you to consider as you prepare for next week's Consecration Sunday. How will you serve God through the ministries of this church? And our text tells us that it happens through a childlike response of faith. A childlike servant is someone who submits their will to submits their will to the will of God. In theological terms, a life that really matters is first and foremost a life that submits itself to the will of God. When James and and, and John were asking for preferred seating, Jesus told them, "That's not my call, and it's not your call." Only God gets to decide who sits where and, and, and who doesn't sit, who sit, sit there as well. You know, we align our lives with whatever it is that God wants from us. Leadership Journal is a publication of Christianity Today, another magazine. And one of the back issues was a story I cut out many years ago and, and have kind of kept it around. Uh, it tells the story of Pastor Steve Cole, 
who uh, talks about a conversation he had with God while he was out jogging one day. Cole had been reading the biography of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers of the 19th century. And as he ran, Cole was asking God to bless his own ministry, just as he had blessed the ministry of Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And as he was running, he kept hearing the name John Spurgeon coming to him. John was Charles' dad. John was a pastor and also the son of a pastor. And John faithfully served a little congregation for many, many years. If he was not the father of Charles, there's no reason his name would ever be remembered. He would have died and faded into the memory of his own parishioners. It was in those moments as, John, as Steve Cole was running that he heard God asking him, what if, what if I want to make you more like John than I do like Charles? Cole writes, would I be willing to serve God faithfully and raise up my children to serve him even if I never gained any recognition, even if no one except my own small congregation ever knew my name? Well, he answered the question, yes, because this would be a lousy sermon illustration if he'd have said anything other than that. But, but what's the point, right? What's the point? What if, what if instead of seats at the right and left hand of Jesus in heaven, God told James and John, I want you to stand at the back of the room? What if? What if that had been God's choice? What, what if God's will for your life turns out to be different than what you had thought it might be, or what you really wanted? What if your life takes a different course than what you had always dreamed it would be? The life that matters, the life that submits itself to the Father's will, is the one that is able to say, God, not my will, but yours be done. Father, do with me what you want me to do. And in that, we have a life that makes a difference for the cause of Jesus Christ, a life that matters. Now, Jesus goes on and he, he, tells, the, he tells those followers that, 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 that a life that matters is a life that sacrifices for other people. In verse 39 of chapter 10, Jesus says, you'll drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. That's kind of a confusing verse. I don't think Jesus is talking about Holy Communion in that moment because in the Old Testament, the cup was a, was a term that was a, a common term for judgment, divine, divine judgment. And I think Jesus is saying in this passage of Scripture that He's going to become a sacrifice offered for us so that we can have forgiveness of our sins. And for Jesus, the intensity of that moment of that suffering was like, would be like going under, kind of going under as we might think of, a, of a, an immersion sort of baptism. We're going down into the deep waters to be um, of suffering or having the floods overwhelm us. When you live a life that matters, Jesus says, there's going to be a cost that goes along with that. It's not always a life of ease and peace, but there can be some pain that goes along with it. Um, a, a, a downer, uh, I, I always have trouble with his first name. Um, Adoniram Judson, Judson and his new bride were among the first missionaries to go into the country of Burma, which is now Myanmar, back in 1812. That's a country for those of us geographically challenged, is just north of Vietnam. They had a baby while they were there. Their baby died because of the poor medical conditions in that country. But they went on and they stayed for seven years sharing their faith. After seven years, they saw their first convert to Christianity. Seven years. When that person converted to Christianity, the political officials didn't like it. So they had Judson arrested and convicted him of being a British spy. They sentenced him to 21 months of hard labor. And when he was released from prison, his body was covered with scars because of his mistreatment by the, the prison officials. Scars that would stay with him for the rest of his life. When he was released from prison, he went back to that judge and he asked for permission to go back to the country, the, the province where he had been serving before. And the judge said, absolutely not. So he said, well, can I go to this other province? And the judge said, no, you can't. 
And the reason the judge told him was, I don't believe my countrymen are foolish enough to believe what any missionary would say. But I do fear they'll see your scars and they'll turn to your religion anyway. Well, Judson defied the order and went on to that second province. And what the judge feared is exactly what happened. Shortly after his death in 1850, about 40 years after they had first gone into the country, a, a census recorded by the Burmese government recorded 210,000 Christians, or one out of every 58 Burmese citizens. The scars spoke louder than the sermons. And so do ours. When we allow God to speak through the pain of our lives, through the sacrifices of our lives, through the down times of our lives, He does. And in that, in that, our lives matter. And finally, Jesus shows us in our text that a life that matters is one that serves. It serves the people around them. Jesus says, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be a slave at all. In a world where everybody demands their rights, it's about life that matters that says, how can I serve you today? Now remember where this falls in the gospel story. I'm reading to you and talking to you from Mark chapters 9 and 10 today. Chapter 11 of Mark is the triumphal entry story in Mark's gospel. So this is right at the very end, right before Jesus goes in uh, before the cross. He's going to begin in just a few days. He's going to begin with the things that we all associate with that holy week of Scripture. He's going to be in just a few days taking a towel and wrapping it around his waist and kneeling at the feet of his disciples on a day that we know is Monday, Thursday. And he's going to want to wash their feet. We don't know if the disciples had ever seen before Jesus an important person serving it certainly wasn't common to their world any more than it's common to ours. But in a matter of days, they were going to observe the greatest example of servanthood that would ever be just demonstrated. If you, might, if you remember the story, Peter objected. He said, I should be washing your feet. But Jesus went ahead and washed Peter's feet anyway. And, and in the book of Philippians, it gets recorded like this. Jesus being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. In the kingdom of God, the order of things gets flipped upside down. The most important people are the ones who serve, the ones at the bottom. The ones at the top aren't those most important people. In the kingdom, it's the servants that matter. The life that matters serves. There's another movie that you ought to see sometime. It's uh, re released in 2002. starred Kevin Kline as an instructor of Western civilization at a prestigious private school. The movie is called The Emperor's Club. On the first day of his class, Kline addresses about 30 high school boys, all dressed in their matching red blazers and surrounded by world maps and busts of famous people like Caesar and Pluto and Socrates. Klein asks one of the students, he has all the students gather around the door to their classroom, and he asks one of the students to read a plaque that's hanging above that door. And the words on the plaque say this, I am Shutruk Nahunte, king of Ashend in Susa, sovereign of the land of Elam. I destroyed Sipar, I took the steel of Nirah Sin and I brought it back to Elam, where I erected it as an offering to my God. And then Klein, the teacher, says to his class, is anyone familiar with this fellow? Open up your textbooks. Today he would say, Google it. Tell me what you can find. He says, but you won't find anything. Shutruk Nahunte, king, sovereign of Elam, destroyer of Sipar, None of his accomplishments can be found in any history book. Why? Because great ambition without contribution is without significance. Great ambition without contribution is without significance. And then he asks his students this, the first question of the school year, what will your contribution be? 
How will your life matter? My mom would always quote to my brother and I, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Amen.